Alafia, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Revisiting African History. It's unfortunate that we have to revisit it. We ought to be living African history because we should never allow ourselves to be outside of our history. When we did a program at the Woodson Regional almost a year ago, uh, we were looking deeply into African history. But of course, you never have enough time because African history is ancient. And consequently, there are some things that uh, don't get enough elaboration. And I thought it would be wise to have two of the presenters from that program to be with me today, Dr. Santawa opong Wadiye and Dr. Joseph Ben Levy. Uh, Dr. Wadier and I were together not long ago when we were talking about the kinds of Africans who came to America. Um, many of, of us do not know, but certainly not these two guests, that Africans didn't see what they now call America for the first time from the uh, gangplank of a, of a sl ship with human cargo but we actually came here on our own and visited and sometimes stayed, but most times went home because we enjoyed being at home more than we did in other people's lands. But there are some of us who were captured and brought as captives uh, to this country, handpicked by um, the people who were enterprising and who, who had uh, I always call them the finding fathers, you know, the fathers who found the resources that they wanted to utilize in building a country that they did not have the expertise to build on their own. So Dr. Wadier has looked into our people, those of our people who can be traced to have been brought here under those conditions and can tell us what kinds of Africans built this country. And I'd like for her to begin and for Dr. Ben Levy to be my guest while we learn this. All right. Um, well, I wanted to start off by saying that um, when we get the first permanent group of Europeans who settle in the United States, they settle in Jamestown, Virginia. And that's around 1607. And we have um, a people who are described by historians as being unfamiliar with the rigors of agriculture. And they are also uh, dependent upon everything that they're gonna eat and wear uh, of ships coming in from the mother colony. So they're dependent upon ships <clears throat> coming in from England to give them everything that they need. So by 1609, when we have a, a couple of storms and shipwrecks, they have nothing. And according to archeological records, they began to even eat each other. So we have a people who don't know how to even take care of their basic needs um, and who in a desperate situation cannot rely on agriculture or partnership with native people. They have to resort to the worst, which is um, eating. They say in their own diaries, we ate cats, mice, dogs, and finally dug up the dead and ate them also. So we have to ask how in about 100 and um, plus years later, maybe 160 or 70 years later, do we get a country that just goes right off the charts, is able to compete with the leading um, countries of the time, France, England, and surpass them in their output production and, and surpass them in what they're able to um, make and sell as a commodity on the world market? How did that happen? when you have such a desperate people 
at the opening of the 1600s. And there is no other explanation for it other than um, the knowledge that they were given by the native people who live here about this terrain, how to survive on it, and the knowledge that came in with all the African people that they brought in because it was obvious that they didn't have it. Right. So um, the idea that African people were these empty vessels who came and just had to be taught everything, including presumably how to brush your teeth and everything, um, and had nothing to offer and were this burden, as they were classified, the white man's burden, um, and he had to train them up as one trains up a child. It's just false. Ra I think the exact opposite might be more true that uh, African people had to um, bring with them the keys of civilization that they have because civilization, um, while it can mean um, behaving in a, a manner that is cool and behaving in a manner that is civil, um, it really means um, sociologically that you have a civilization that is able to feed itself and then move to the next tier. You know, then you can hire artisans and you can um, hire uh, craft people and then you can hire the next tier, which is government officials. So you have a civilization, a civilization is a society that is able to build itself up to a governing body. And all of those people who function in government are being fed. Um, they don't worry about eating because that's already taken care of. So it's very clear when you can't eat that you can't move forward. You know. So how did they get to feed themselves so quickly, become efficient at it very quickly, um, and be able to build up a civilization, one that would um, rival everyone else? Clearly, it wasn't their brain trust. They borrowed. Um, the brain trust of a people who had been doing that for hundreds of thousands of years. So in with the African people we get in the work of Dr. Joseph Holloway who looked at the uh, records of people who came in through the ports in South Carolina. We get this information about who came in and when and we know that during the 1600s the, um, the predominant people that entered the United States were Wolof people uh, from the Senegal area the area that we call Senegal today. And we know that some of their words still exist in the English language. Words like banana, words like even okay, you know, are of their origin. Um, because, because they integrated so early in colonial America, uh, colonial America held on in their English to some of those words and um, behaviors also. And we know that starting in the 1700s um, into um, South Carolina, we get a lot of Angolans. And this would continue until 1739 and the Stono Rebellion, when they realized that the commonality of the people from Angola, Congo, all of them speaking the same language, um, gives them leverage. Um, they realized we have to diversify. But they wanted those African people in there because uh, they were hard workers. This is what is on record. This is not us speculating. Um, this is what they record uh, in their own books and in their own diaries and journals. So, for example, when we look at who they brought in, um, we find that um, the Yorubas and um, people from Dahomey um, were preferred um, because they were considered docile. This is what they say, and I'm giving you a direct quote here. They say that they are lusty and cheerful and industrious and believed to be submissive. Um, and that they take to floggings and bondage, and that they are good household servants and artisans. So this is their own admission. And they also said of people from Senegambia that they were good commanders over other Negroes, having high spirits, and they are tolerable with a share of fidelity, but they are unfit for hard work. But then, right, um, Someone else, publishing somewhere else, said, oh no, we need the people from Senegambia because they are used to rice and yam and millet and they know how to cultivate these things. And in with them comes technology. And I know in the age that we live in, we consider technology things that are digital. But in, the, in that time period in colonial America, technology was anything that could help you get work done, right? So the basket that winnowed rice. Um, although we don't consider that high tech today, that was high tech then because that was what was needed to build civilization, right? The mortar and the pestle and how to use it to haul rice or to haul anything else that comes in a husk from out of the field uh, was something that Europeans needed to be taught and that African people readily brought with them. And so we also have the Mande people coming in uh, from the Niger River area and they were great rowers 
and they were uh, they had fish um, fish netting that is still used in um, parts of the Gullahs, the, where the Gullah and the Geechee people live on the um, eastern coast of the United States. Those techniques are still being used. And, and these kind of tech technologies would advance the people who didn't have access to food how to catch large quantities of fish, fish that we can now store, we could use for more than one day, you know? And um, they were great at water transportation. We even have on record um, some of their dugout canoes that are made exactly the same way on the Niger River today. Um, we have those on record as being made in early America. And so all of these things they bring in they bring in when they bring in people. And so we find like in their uh, request for Africans to come here that they ask for these kind of things. West African women, especially women from the Senegal area, uh, were highly desired because they said they were very hygienic. They said they were excellent wet nurses, cooks, washerwomen, hairstylists, herbalists, midwives, and they had a notable level of compassion for the sick. This is, they, they didn't have that in their culture. They recognize that we need that. Look, look how great, great she is with handling someone who's sick, handling someone who's ready to give birth, handling a newborn. She's efficient. But these women had perfected these skills over generations and intergenerational knowledge. And uh, Europe just grafted it onto itself and used it as a huge step up into to, to, to compete on the world stage. And one of the things that um, Dr. Joseph Holloway brings to our attention is that even um, a term like um, cowboy probably would be cow men if it was really originally used to refer to European men. But because it was used to refer to African people originally, um, that's why it remained boy. And even though the cowboy is iconic, almost exclusively associated with the American uh, image, um, it is in fact an African idea, um, now Europeanized, you know, at least in its image. But this idea of walking cattle north-south and um, taking cattle in great distances to feed on different types of grass is not something that was done in Europe. Europe had smaller pastures and kept animals enclosed and had shepherding in enclosed areas, but wide, uh, walking across the African Sahel with uh, animals for uh, days even at a time, playing music portable, like uh, the guitar, the banjo, um, bringing music to play at night. Now that is so associated with country music and cowboyism, it's actually an Africanism. And allowed uh, America to have large, uh, a large cache of animals. You know, they weren't able to raise that many animals because you couldn't feed that many, not in a um, stationary sort of living. You know, to really feed that many animals, you've got to go where you can get more greener pastures, you know, as it were. Yeah. So they brought in this kind of knowledge when they brought in people. And I want to pull up on just a few more um, ideas. They asked for um, Ashanti men and Benin men because they were known stone workers, iron workers, cabinet makers, just generally good with uh, wood and with iron to make wheel riding, you know, make the making of the wheel. Um, th these were skills they brought in with people and they didn't have, because of the differences in language, the opportunity to teach them that fast. And what we get from the record um, from the era of enslavement is that um, they would often apprentice a, a newcomer with someone who had been there already, um, who, who knew the skill, who knew how to make it to the European specification. And this is how the craft would pass down from um, one person to the other. So we get a lot of, a huge amount of examples in colonial America and in post-colonial America of African people doing wonderful things. And this is kind of suppressed. It's subjugated knowledge um, when it comes to American history. But we know, for example, that a gentleman named um, Juan Simeus, I hope that I'm pronouncing that right, um, was able to show his, uh, if one can have an owner that is his uh, owner, Cotton Mather, that, you know what, I was immunized against smallpox mm -hmm. by um, my mother or uh, a woman in my family using a mild form of small, smallpox that somebody else had and using the pus and putting it in my skin, just cutting my skin and putting it in. Now this is the basis of immunizations that we call, as we call it today. And when Cotton Mather published this study, um, and this idea, his house uh, was uh, someone threw fi uh, fire, 
a, a lit bottle of fire into his window. Molotov cocktail. Yeah. You know, as a way of saying, how dare you come with that idea? It's almost like when the Greeks went into ancient Egypt to get information and went back to Greece, they were looked upon as being, are you crazy? You're alien. coming. Right. Mm -hmm. So th this was an alien idea. Mm -hmm. And um, Cotton Mather saw it through. Um, he did an experiment, and uh, when smallpox swept through Boston, only 2% of the people who were treated using his method actually uh, fell victim to it, Where, whereas 14% of the people who did not um, fell victim. And that is how uh, that idea got put over. But it was given to him, and he owns that in his diary by uh, the African whom he enslaved. And I mean, the, the, the examples are numerous. Uh, there's a film that I think everyone interested in this subject should see called All My Babies, where it talks about uh, um, African-American midwives in the United States. And you will hear doctors in that film say things like, I didn't know that we could deliver a baby uh, without giving a woman an episiotomy where you know we do some cutting so the mother does not tear. Did, did not know that and um, had to watch old African-American midwives using things that they learned in other generations, from other generations, use just hot compresses, hot towels to do the same job with no tearing. Um, and, and doctors saying that we learned from them. These are people who we sat down and watched the way they did their craft. And this craft was kept intact, which is really the miracle of it, that we were able to survive with a semblance of culture. And really, it was because we had to. We didn't have anywhere else to go. We just had each other. And um, one of the things that is really striking about the United States is that in the South, um, they say, well, there's such Southern hospitality. And um, the author, um, John Edward Phillips, says, well, where does that come from? If it's not from Europe, then where is it from? You know, and of course, that is the old African culture that we can just take for granted and call it Southern hospitality without adding the complexity that is needed. Where is the reverence for the elders coming from? Where is the terms of endearment, madeir and ma'am? And where is all of that coming from when there is no antecedent for that in European culture? And um, when we put a close lens on what is here in America, much of it is an Africanism, is a holdover, is a retention from Africa, is what African people did and brought to bring civilization to this land. Well, I think that was, you know what? <laughs> that was so eye-opening, you know, because those kinds of things are not generally known, you know. In the first place, just to make the statement that understand when the first European settlers came here, they were not wealthy people who came in with a lot of resources. They came with nothing. In many cases, they were evicted from Europe because right. they were the, the, um, the scoundrels. They would, they, many times when they came, they were released from, from prisons, yeah, they food. were shipped over here to get rid of them or sometimes they were bribed if you will go away right. we will give you a boat and some money and some some provisions so that you can go someplace else you know the it, it's a line that goes through all the fairy tales go out into the world and seek your fortune because right. it was never presumed that your fortune was where you were among your own people, even in the fairy tales. The wow. children were put out of the house. Remember Hansel and Gretel? Right. They were put out, in the house, out of the house because when you attain a certain level of maturity, which was, it seems to me from the, the images in the, in the fairy tales, that these were young, very young children right. who were sent out into the world to seek their fortune because their fortune obviously was not at home right. and was not in the family. So they would bribe people to come by giving them provisions and, and transportation and, and money to leave. And then, of course, there were the others that they would just send away, just, right. just excommunicated so that they would stop being troublemakers in, in Europe. So that when they came, they had nothing. They came here with nothing. And I'm, my understanding is that the first uh, group of settlers and maybe even the second group of settlers allegedly who settled in Jamestown perished, not only because they had nothing, 
but because they were trifling and they refused to follow the advice of the natives who lived here, right. who said, winter will come and you will need to begin to prepare for that. You will need to you know, raise these crops, you will need to preserve some of it, you will need to store it and be prepared for the time when nothing will grow and you will have to rely upon what you have already, you know, stored. So they had nothing. So when your question, when, when you raise the right question as to whence cometh this wealth right. that you did not bring with you, okay, right. then you understand that this wealth was ill-gotten. Right. Exactly. You didn't work for it, right. you didn't bring it with you, and you got it by any means necessary. Right. And one of the means that you saw as essential was to go out and search for other people whom you could exploit and, and use to, to build your wealth and, and your country. So we need to just understand that. Right. I mean, we just need to understand here are some people with nothing who now have seemingly have everything right. But if you want to make a case for reparations, that's about the soundest case you can make, right. you know. We have built, it, Dr. Margaret says, uh, people upon whose back has been built the wealth of nations. That's right. So we have been everybody's, everybody's resource. And now we're in a situation where it is very difficult for us to be resourceful enough to keep ourselves mm -hmm. alive, surviving, and developing. I thank you for that. I really do. Yeah. And you tell that story so well. Now we'll go to our patient, Dr. <laughs> Joseph Ben Levy, who has been sitting here. At, uh, we both are so fond of you, Asantawa. Oh, thank you. We yes, are. we are. We are. And, and Asantawa and I are, are both so fond of you. And you may enter into this revisiting African history wherever you like. Okay, well thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peace, once again, for having me on. And of course, I'm honored to be here with uh, Dr. Wadier, you know, you know, she's brilliant. I mean, we could both go on forever about talking about these things. I, I, I do want to mention about uh, what you were talking about, and that is, uh, um, well, I want to do two lines of thinking. One I want to share with you is the idea of the ship of fools. Uh, one of the things that happened when, uh, um, when uh, we, we found ourselves in this period of time in Europe where uh, they were, uh, were unable to take care of everybody, there was a lot of crime and things going on, that they grabbed a bunch of people and put them on the ship and sent them out to wherever they want to go. Essentially, they were some of the criminals and so forth that they put on these ships, what they call the ship of fools. Uh, a, a French uh, uh, philosopher, uh, Michel Foucault, talks about this. And one group came to the States, and of course another group went to Australia. All right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I want to uh, uh, address is um, that all the things that she's talking about are very, very important. Cotton Mather, I mean, his whole history here in the United States is, is a thing by itself. And of course, about the thing is of, of solving uh, the, the disease issue is very rarely known. But one of the things I wanted to look at, and one of the things I had talked about before, and I think we can go into a little further, is some of the, uh, the, the future consequences of how the story was changed on us, particularly from the standpoint of philosophy, all right? Because one of the things that happened to remove some of those uh, uh, fundamental ideas was that a justification had to be made for the, the uh, capturing of people who were free and then enslaving them. And one of those stories uh, was developed uh, in what they call uh, the Hamite Hypothesis. Mm -hmm. The Hamite Hypothesis essentially states uh, that uh, uh, black people were cursed uh, to be black and that there were a lot of consequences as long that, that came along with that. And uh, of course, the foundations of the story of the curse of Ham are in the Babylonian Talmud. But you have people like Charles Seligman, and uh, who started these ideas, who was an early cultural anthropologist. And then you had people like Josiah Nott, uh, George Glidden, and uh, uh, George Samuel Morton, Sam, you know, Samuel Morton. These were the fathers and the founders of what we call American anthropology. Right. And they perpetuated these ideas. Well, along with these ideas came 
other arguments. One of those fundamental arguments was based on what's called the cultural epoch theory. The cultural epoch theory states that civilization goes through various stages. And you go from, um, from savagery to barbarism to civilization. It was always argued that, that Africans were incapable of moving not far out of the savagery stage and partially into the uh, semi-barbaric state. Well, the consequence of that argument is also that uh, people of African descent are incapable of speculative thought. So that we have a fundamental problem that uh, most students do not learn philosophy until they get to the university. Uh, and it is assumed that they cannot learn these things early on, say, for example, in elementary or high school. And it's almost as a rule that in most African American uh, schools, and particularly in high schools, they do not teach philosophy at all. Mm -hmm. And the, funda the, the fundamental reason for that is that there's this assumption um, in European continentalist philosophy, which did not develop until, after, in, until the period of the Renaissance, that African people are incapable of thinking like that, incapable of having philosophy. So they would argue that, that Africans have what they call ethno-philosophy. Now, I find the term ethno-philosophy kind of funny, seeing that traditionally most people are, that, te that teach continentalist philosophy, and when I say continentalist philosophy, I mean the philosophy that was developed in Europe after the Renaissance, that is the ideas of Rousseau, Descartes, Montesquieu, uh, Wittgen, you know, that group. Uh, who are called the continentalists, and I believe that there's a reason for teaching the continent, continentalist philosophers without going into the ancients, what we call the Socratics and the pre-Socratics. You know, the Socratics being Socrates, uh, Plato, Aristotle, and the pre-Socratics being Thales, Pythagoras, you know, uh, Anaximenes, Anaximander, and all those groups. Basically, they're not really taught much about, and and part of that is because the uh, the the same continentalist philosophers, people like you know Immanuel Kant. Uh, came up with ideas of, that had to justify the enslavement of African people. And oftentimes, when, when their philosophies are taught, that part of their philosophy is not really taught. You have to really read their text and their ideas to get that. But the truth of the matter is that nobody ever asked, when did they get their philosophy? How did they get this philosophy? You know, nobody ever addressed, addressed the question of what happened in Florence in the, in, in the uh, in the you know, 14th century when under the Medici family, many of whom we would describe today as blacks, uh, if we really looked at them, uh, oftentimes nobody wants to address that issue either, but I think that that's very, very important. The, the fact that during this time there was a man by the name of Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno, uh, during the time of the Medicis, had been, uh, particularly under Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, this was during the time that Niccolo Machiavelli was also alive, uh, who wrote The Famous Prince. Uh, during this time, they had uh, found this knowledge that had come from the East. And of course, a lot of this knowledge was being transferred to them uh, through Arab writers. And the Arabs, when they came in the, into, into Egypt in 639, they found all of the Greek writings that had been translated from Medunetra and were translating them now into Arabic. And of course, later on, these, these, many of these ideas came to Greece, um, came to uh, Italy. Under, in Florence because the Florentines were very, very big on selling books and selling everything else. They were merchants. They were the merchant capital of the world. So what happens is that uh, uh, the Medici come to realize that uh, well, they're in the process of translating uh, uh, Plato, Plato's Republic. And they come to, not Plato's Republic, but uh, uh, Timius and Critias. Well, they come to realize when they're looking at this that Plato by his own acknowledgement, had studied in, in Kemet, in Egypt. And so what they told him to do was to stop uh, translating uh, um, Plato and to start looking at these early Kemetic texts, which they came to call Hermetic text. Mm -hmm. All right, Hermes is merely the Greek form of the ancient Egyptian Jehudi, who was the principle of, of writing and wisdom and so forth that the, that the Greeks translated as thought, but they also used the term Hermes. We get, the mer we get the term Hermes was the interpreter of the messages that went to the deity. We get the word hermeneutics from that, right? The idea of the interpretation of ideas and text. Well, this hermetic literature that they started uh, putting together became the fundamental text to be used among all scholars and priests 
in ancient in, in in Europe at that time. It was the foundations of that that were that were that were used to make possible the development of what they called the Platonic Academy in uh, Florence, which was the first university established in Europe. And so, it was that particular material, particular material that was foundational to all of the earlier thought that existed in what we have come to know as European philosophy. This is why uh, uh, one uh, uh, famous European uh, uh, philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, argued that all philosophy is merely a footnote to Plato. Well, since most people who teach philosophy themselves cannot acknowledge what philosophy is, it's very hard for them to say that therefore nobody else can do philosophizing but us, when fundamentally the idea, first off, in the earliest form of Greek, Attic Greek, there is no word called philosophy. It is Plato, I mean, it is Pythagoras, who on the suggestion of Thales, who is considered the first so-called European philosopher, even though he didn't even live in Europe, he lived in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today, in Ionia, uh, recommended that Pythagoras go to Egypt to study because Thales had went to Egypt to study geometry. And it's basically he says this, that I, Thales, went to Egypt and studied uh, geometry and brought it back to Greece. This was before Pythagoras. So he has Pythagoras go to Egypt to study under them because these are the people who, who, who had really the knowledge. Uh, and, and of course, we have many, many examples of others, Anaximander, Anaximenes. You know, Thales is the first one to argue that the, the foundation of everything is water. Well, he learned that from the idea of Noom and Kemet. So all these ideas were, were there to be developed and to be pushed forward and stuff. And, but it was there that they went to get that knowledge in the Nile Valley, which is, which is the foundational. Now, one of the things that they, if, if they would argue that, okay, that, African people can't do speculative thought and can't do any type of thinking. And guess what they base that on? They base that on simply on the fact that, well, you know, in order to be, to be considered to be one of those people who do that, you know, you got to publish in journals, you got to write some books and stuff like that, right? Well, it's very funny that one of the reasons why most Europeans don't understand the idea of what we can think of as African philosophy is that they don't understand that philosophy is Technically, the Greek word itself, philo, was one of three words that means love in, in Greek. You have philo for love, that is, you know, love or speculative things. You have uh, eros, which is sexual love. We get the word erotic, 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 erotic from that. And you have other things like, um, uh, like agape and other words like that that all relate to these concepts of, of, of love. You know, we like Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia, right? Brotherly. Philadelphia, philo love, right? So, but philosophia means love of wisdom. I always like to argue that philosophia literally means love of the lady wisdom, seeing as I like to point out all the time that I don't know no men named Sophia, all right? There are no men named Sophia. So, and wisdom is always a woman and never a man, right? So, they had these ideas, but oftentimes one of the fundamental reasons why most uh, European philosophers would argue that Africans have no philosophy because they have one fundamental error. They first off don't understand the culture and they certainly don't understand the languages. And so without understanding of the language, it is very difficult to crack the code of thinking within most African cultures. But if you want to study, you know, traditional European uh, philosophy, it is mandatory. I don't care whether you're African, African American, whoever you are, it is mandatory that you have you some knowledge of Greek. Or, or if you want to get into the thinking of, 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 of Latin thought, you know, of the Romans, you have to study Latin. But it's not a requirement that they study it. And since there's an assumption that Africans speak, you know, don't really speak coherent languages, you know, then therefore, you know, there's no, it's impossible to assume that they have speculative thought within the languages. And that's why they can assume that Africans, when they have, a, when they have their philosophy, they can call it magic. All right. It's always magic, something spooky, <laughs> you know, when in fact, in Madhu Nature, there's no such word as magic. It's like there's no such word of religion. That's why there's no such thing as what they can call ancient Egyptian religion, because that word didn't exist. And as I like to always point out to my students, how can you conceptualize an idea that was not within your conceptual frame of reference and the people who thought up the idea were not even in existence at that time? So how can you possibly have an idea that can be 
you know, kind of thrown Retroactive. back on you, retroactively <laughs> thrown back on you that didn't exist in the first place, right? When in fact the term that that that, that they like to translate as magic, hakao, means the the spoken. utterance, yeah. spoken word. Okay. All right? And and this makes perfect sense because this is the same thing that they refer to when they speak of logos. Logos means not only so, you know so much word as reasoned discourse. And so what you're seeing in the Kemetic text, a lot of reasoned discourse that goes on because this is where you have your first examples of what we refer to as dialogue taking place mm -hmm. that Socrates develops, the notion of the dialogue, you know, where somebody is raising some questions and then somebody is trying to answer those questions in a certain kind of way, you know, what they call a Socratic method. And we know that Socrates didn't write anything. But one of the other elements I like to point out, uh, and I like to throw this out at, at my students, is that if we are finding that these texts have been translated in these different ways uh, to get to what we have in the Latin and later on in the other languages, you know, there's also some question about whether or not we actually have the right thing. In order to know whether or not you got the right thing, you may have to go back to the original ideas. For example, Plotinus, who wrote the, who wrote the Aeneid, all right, about the, uh, you know, the, the, the Ogdod, as they call them, the eight infinite ones, this comes straight out of Kemet. If you read Plotinus, who was what they call a native Egyptian, which is a very clever term. See, because native Egyptian means one of the original people of Kemet, hmm. all right? And Plotinus's work is directly from Kemet. It's word for word. And there are many, many other examples of stuff like that where we do have these very powerful and very strong uh, uh, thoughts and concepts and so forth, of, especially about the importance of the word and other types of things. And so what we find later on is that um, many of the early European writers are beginning to downplay this. And they start, of course, fundamentally with Frederick Wilhelm Hegel. Because Hegel in the philosophy of history of philosophy of right makes the case that, that Africa has no place in history. And many people then have written history based on Hegel's concept that Africa has no place in history. Even though Hegel contradicts himself if you read him, where Hegel will say that, well, at one point, Egypt is no part of Africa. It is wholly a part of Europe, that's what he said. And how he figured that out uh, on any map, even at his time, I don't know. And then he comes back and says, but we can also acknowledge that ancient Egypt owes much to the civilization in Ethiopia, right? Because he's read Strabo, he knows that. So in a way he's contradicting himself, but also if we go back to the idea of the Hamite hypothesis, which they also lay now, the Hamite hypothesis says that any civilization that exists in Africa came from some mysterious, unknown Caucasians that showed up. Anything that happened in Africa that had been Chariots done with a civilization. The gods. Yeah. Oh, oh if the Von Daniken theory. I, 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 I like him because, you know, he goes along with the, what I call the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ancient astronauts people because, no, you know, somebody from had somewhere from came from someplace and, and did this. this because those Africans and other, you know, indigenous peoples could not possibly have built these monuments and stuff. And yet, you know, if you know, we can make the same case where the, the most famous monument they talk about in Europe and it's Stonehenge, all right? But if you read McRitchie's Ancient and Modern Britons, in, in McRitchie talks about these Australoid people who lived there and made these things possible. And so, and there are many, many, many examples of stuff like this, but yeah, when we look at the way philosophy is taught, and see, and this is the thing to me that turns off a lot of our people from the study of philosophy, you know, is that, First off, nobody is willing to make that step to the Nile Valley because they don't know and how to make the connections. Or even to show where the, where the ancient uh, Greek writers refer to the fact that they went to Egypt to study. And they say this, they, they say this themselves. You know, there's the famous statement, of course, in, 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 in Plato's Atimius, where Solomon, one of the seven sages of Greece, goes to the Egyptian priest because he's trying to find out how old, how, how old are we? And the base of the priest is like, you know, Solomon, Solomon, you Greeks are nothing but children. You know, it's like every time y'all get lost, you come back to us and ask us who you are and where you come from, and we got to remind you. But it was also because the ancient Greeks recognized that those, the people who lived there in the Nile Valley were very ancient. 
and they didn't have a problem with it. You know, they weren't afraid of it. They weren't ashamed of it or anything like that. They accepted that. And I think what has happened is that because of the, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, um, the dominance of, of, of what we might call, you know, European hege hegemony right. over the world, then their thought has become, has been perceived as the only kind of thought. And I always like to tell people, so what was the world doing right. for centuries when the Greeks were sitting there, or what was happening before the, 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 the Renaissance, that is this rebirth period, because we got to remember that the, 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 what was going on in the world at the time was, was that the Moors were running the whole world between 711 and 1492, very important date, when these Moors, these Africans, were running most of Europe. And I used to tell people, I know because I went to school in Spain. I studied there. I studied at some of these universities that were established by the Moors. I went to the places where they went and did their things. So I always tell people, you know, I was there, I know. All right, and the instructors used to talk about this in history class like as a, you know, a, a, a kind of a matter of fact thing. It was no big deal. Whereas here, the way that they tell us is that these were some type of Arabs. All right, no, they were Africans who practiced Islam, many of them. And so th this is not known, but, but we noticed that all of a sudden, with the fall of the, uh, of the, of the Islamic uh, uh, rule in Europe, we get the rise of the Renaissance. And as I like to point out to people, they always talk about the Dark Ages. You know, there's a whole lot of country about when and, whether, when and where and how and whether or not there was a Dark Ages, rather than referring to it as the Age of Enlightenment in Africa and Asia, because that's what was really going on. But they overlooked that by saying, well, you know, it's the dark ages in Europe. But what was the rest of the world doing? The rest of the world wasn't sitting in what they call the dark. And what they mean by being dark anyway? You know, and what happened like that? But all this plays a role into this whole idea of how we think about thinking about history, you know, historiography, how, you know, the writing of history, how is it written and who writes it and how they write it and who their audiences are and how they write. And unfortunately, you know, the way our children get it, it's always very, very uh, skewed and distorted. And, and this is well known, so I think that is why it's important that, you know, that people might, like myself, Dr. Wadier, you know, we get out here, we share some of our stuff, you know, we go out and we talk about these things, we try to, you know, uh, get some of this information put into the school system so that at a young age our children learn, because that's what the Greeks were doing. The Greeks started having their children learn this at a very young age. And, and building up with it over time. This is how we get places like the academy and the porch and, the, and, the, um, um, and, and, and these other things that they had with, that were schools of thought uh, at this time in ancient Greece to develop these different types of schools. And then there's the other thing, and then I'm gonna shut up for a minute, and that's that without these great thinkers, some of the fundamental ideas that we think of as early Christian thought, and most people don't study early Christian thought, you know, they would realize that the people who thought these things were Africans. I'm talking about Augustine, Tertullian, Terence, Cyprian, Hypatia, um, who are great thinkers, the, 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 the Didiascalia uh, um, uh, that was produced under Clement of, uh, Clement of Alexandria, see, because people don't know, since, since we are the most geographically illiterate people in the world, we don't know modern geography, let alone ancient geography. Mm -hmm. We don't know people like that, people like Cornelius Fronto, who was the teacher of Marcus Aurelius, who uh, was a great Stoic philosopher. If it wasn't for, Marco, for, for Cornelius Fronto teaching uh, 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 Marcus, or Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius would have never been able to write the, to write the, uh, the, um, the meditations. And, so, and there were others examples because the smartest people around them were these particular people in Carthage whom they call rhetoricians. They were the, law, the lawyers at the time. Some people have argued that rhetoricians are not philosophers. You know, but if they weren't, I don't know what it was, but since rhetoric is a kind of a division of thought like that in, in writing and dictating, you know, dictating and debating and so forth, uh, that is also a part of philosophy, but they could say that's not really philosophy. They, they, some have argued, well, you know, Clelia Fronto, he really wasn't a philosopher, he was a rhetorician, you know, because philosophy is unique to Europeans, all right? Mm -hmm. Michel Foucault makes this argument, and I would argue with him that he's wrong, you know, because what makes him a philosopher, you know? You know I'm so happy to have the two of you because, see, we, we are doing African history. Mm -hmm. Not just talking about it in terms of dates and events. The thing that always bothered me about Negro history 
and does still bother me about black history is that it's always grounded in biography. Mm -hmm. You learn about this person who went from rags to riches. Mm -hmm. You learn about this runaway slave who grew up to be this important person. You learn about this, this, you know, it's always the life of an individual who somehow was commendable in the eyes of the people who control the storyline mm -hmm. about this society. We want to know what African people did, That's right. what African people thought, what African people built people, mm -hmm. not, I, you know, I have all the admiration in the world for Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. I have a, a lot of admiration for Mahalia Jackson. But we had yes. scores, right. endless numbers of African people who were talented, who were brilliant, who were resourceful, who improvised, who made a way out of no way. And that should be the ground of our history. What did our people do? What problems did they face? How did they solve the problems? Not what contributions they made to some world made by other people, but what the world owes them for what they gave and what was taken, things of which they were robbed you know, these are the, this, this to me is African history. African history is who were the people? Who are the people? What was their way of life? What was their culture? What did they do as a people? Not as a tribe over here and one over there, but as a blend of people all sharing corporal values, not all practicing the same customs, not always doing the same thing in the same way, but sharing so many values that are in common that they even survive until this day. That's right. And so to have you here, see, to have, to show, here's somebody who is, who's not just talking, as, as the young people say, out your neck, because mm -hmm. we get a lot of that. But people who, who took the time to read, to research, to compare, to know, to understand, there, there is nothing anywhere worth having that did not originate in African people. And I had a recent conversation with two young people who were telling me about the advantages of other ethnic groups because of the privilege that their family shared. The DNA was what they used. Mm -hmm. You know, these uh, children get better grades in school because their father's a doctor and their mother's an engineer. You know, and I said, well, if you think that these people have DNA that's superior to yours, where does that leave you? Because certainly you can't aspire to anything mm -hmm. if you think that here are some privileged people who, you know, who have parents. I said, you have ancestors right. with the DNA that you're talking about. Right. We gave the world medicine. We gave the world the laws of mathematics on which engineering is founded. How can you give credit to the latecomers right. And the reason is because you don't know your history right. and because your history isn't being taught. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the beauty that, of having you two here is that now there may be an opportunity for you to get involved in a law that now seems on the brink of being implemented, which is to teach African history right. to all the children in all the grades, mm -hmm. kindergarten through high school. So talk to me a little bit about that, Asantua. Um, well, the first thing that I would say is that um, I definitely hope that um, everything falls in place for this to be um, implemented, not just talked about, 
um, but implemented in Chicago public schools and for the Illinois Amistad Bill and its um, concomitant um, curriculum to be implemented throughout Illinois. Um, you know, there's a lot of possible pitfalls, and so I hope all of that is overcome, and that's going to take the efforts of a lot of people. And I, myself, I am dedicated to um, making sure that I do what I can. But we must do have. this. We must do this. Dr. Burroughs, again, what shall I tell my children who are black? Mm -hmm. I must do this for myself. Mm -hmm. That's right. No one will do, do this it. for me. Yeah, that's right. Whether or not somebody sitting in a building somewhere mm -hmm. with a staff, decides that our children can have access to their history is not up to them. Right. It's up to us. First of all, Dr. Burrow said in her poem, we must search, we must find it, we must drink deep mm -hmm. of the culture of Africa. We must search and find it for ourselves and then we must pass it on to them because we owe it not only to them, but we owe it to humanity right. because our children, as she said, may mm -hmm. bear the genius to discover a cure, and she names cancer, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. To have our children restricted, to have our children weighted down, to have millstones hung around their necks so that they cannot thrive and they cannot survive and they cannot bring speculative thought mm -hmm. right. <laughs> forth. Right. Because if children are allowed to be educated, they, when they search and find their own strengths, then we will see more of you. You don't have to, you did you wait for somebody to find who you were or what you could know? Mm -hmm. no. You know a lot more than most teachers know because you are self-educated, because right. you knew there were things you needed to know right. for the same reason. What, when did you start studying? When, I when was you was nine or something <laughs> with your grandfather? Uh, yeah, right. yeah, something like, so I, re, I was really pretty, pretty young. I didn't start really getting serious about it until I was about 15 or 16. Why did you, how did you know to get serious about it? Um, how did you know that you were supposed to know things? Well. Uh, a, a lot of it for me had to do with um, the fact that I realized that people were not really telling us the truth. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is I would go back and check stuff out. And as I checked things out, I began to realize more and more and more that people were not, you, in other words, what I was doing was engaging in critical thinking before I knew what critical thinking was. Mm -hmm. I was asking myself, well, where did that come from? And, and why did you say that? And, mm -hmm. and where did you get that or from? Is that true? You know, is that true? You know, and then I come to find out a lot of things were not true. And that oftentimes, even the teachers that were sharing the things with us were not really as informed as they should be. Mm -hmm. And I got in trouble a lot of times when I was in high school in particular for trying to correct people, mm -hmm. you know, and having a story where, you know, I got mine, you got to get yours. Okay, well, mm -hmm. now I got mine. Now what? All right? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. But I was ready even, even back then. But one of the things that... Um, I got to give her some time because I want her to answer that question. Okay. I, I want to speak about the Negro Convention Movement. I got five right. minutes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Well, I just want to say quickly that um, I am a product of people who saw it necessary to come, you know, back and lend a hand and say, you know what, here's some history that I know you must know. And um, it may not ever be taught to you in school. Let's meet outside of school. And so we had study groups that really got me started and really got me excited um, about learning about myself. And I want to just say quickly on the back of that that uh, one of the reasons to take history away from someone is in order to commodify them yes. and to provide a justification that they are somewhat and somehow worthy of the pain you're going to inflict on them and that they are causing it themselves. They don't even have a story attached to them. So the removal of someone's story is the removal of their humanity. And uh, Europeans knew that very well. And so Josiah Knott um, and all the other um, thinkers that came out, who actually sat down and invented and crafted yes. racism. Racism was crafted like anything else is crafted in a lab. Mm -hmm. It was thought out and crafted starting with notes on the uh, states, state of Virginia mm -hmm. with Thomas Jefferson saying, I think we might put forward that these African people are not the same as we are. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and he called on scientists to go out and discover why yes. th that was not so, you know, or why that was so. And that's, how, that's I mean, it was designed. And the, the, the reason behind that was to justify. It has no truth to it. It has no bearing. So everyone should be a part of breaking down this myth mm -hmm. because it has no bearing. It was just created to justify um, wrong behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to go along with that, I was talking about during the, during, the during the 1830s, they had the Negro Conventions Movement. During the Negro Conventions Movement, you had a lot of, you know, uh, blacks at that time who were d fighting over what they call the naming controversy. That for a long, long time, almost everything we did, the Africa Free Schools, the, the Africa the, uh, 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 Historical Society. African-American, you know, African Methodist Episcopal right, Church. Right, all of this, right? <laughs> all of it had Africa in it. And there was a group who were then trying to find a way not to feel uh, 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 disrespected by, you know, by the, the powers in the, in, the, uh, in the state at that time, you know, the, the, the government at that time. And so they decided that we need to think about changing our name. <laughs> and we've been in the name <laughs> game uh, since that time. Mm -hmm. And, and it looks like ultimately we may finally find our way back because see, we see we're still the only people in the United States that hyphenate our, hyphenate our name. You know, we're African Americans, and and again the term the term African American, of course, we know didn't get into use until roughly about the 1980s, the late 1980s. Uh, even though we can make a case to, for it even earlier, but in its more contemporary form. And unfortunately, what happened is that um, uh, we still haven't made the land connection. You know that land that that connects to land language and culture that uh, is very very important and you know and like uh, and, and finally I'll say that you know Dr. John Henry Clark always likes to tell the story that when he met Dr. Arthur Schomburg when he's like 16 years old he wanted to come say I want to know everything about uh, you know the, the history of black people <laughs> this hour your lunch hour when he mm -hmm. told him sit down so let me tell you something he said what you're calling black history is world history is merely the missing pages of world history That's so right. he said son go back and study world history and so I think a part of what we're doing here is introducing world history and showing you where we've been always a part of what they call world history at all times. Well, I certainly thank you for bringing world history to the forefront. And I think that it's very important for us to understand that the commitment has to be not just on the part of educators, but it has to be on the part of all responsible adult Africans in America and one of the things that I want to leave with you is that we have to question even if you're going to talk about a hyphenated name African American mm -hmm. you got to question where the word where the name America came from yes. because the original people on this land mass right. called it Turtle Island mm -hmm. they right. did not call it America, yeah, America. and they did not call themselves Americans. Absolutely. They had names mm -hmm. like right. the Algonquin Agon yes. and the Navajo mm -hmm. and you know the the various so-called Indian mm -hmm. quote you know there's so much in the language that is in error mm -hmm. and so when you're calling yourself an African-American one half of that is up to question because the people who lived here first did not call this landmass America. We're glad that we were together. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hotep. Long, long time. We've been deceived by the illusion. We're called by different names. And this has served to just confuse us. When all is said and done, to be one's our revolution. We never stand alone. Tease our resolution